Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here and it's time for part two of the Q&A, so let's go ahead and get this started. First question, are there any products or suggestions that you would recommend to get adequate fruit and veggies in? I seem to be able to only get about three cups of vegetables a day and not really any fruit at all and I would love to be getting more antioxidants. Um, I know there are quite a bit of supplements out there, but I uh, wanted your stance on it since you're usually against supplementation. FYI, my fiber intake is already around 40 grams on low carb days, 2,500 ish calories, and 60 grams on uh, high carb days, which is around 3,000 ish calories. All right, brother. First of all, yeah, you got that right. I am anti supplement. I don't think that there is any viable supplement out there that can compensate for a bad diet. Um, you need to just get in more fruits and vegetables. If you struggle to get more in, frozen fruits and vegetables are a fantastic way. Uh, get yourself some frozen berries and put a little Greek yogurt or yogurt on those and you're good to go as far as getting more antioxidants in. Things like um, red wine is a great source of antioxidants, a glass of red wine before bed. And just in general, frozen vegetables are an easy way to get more veggies in. If you can't get enough in, just sprinkle some frozen vegetables into everything you throw in the oven to eat. Uh, any sort of smoothie or anything you blend up, whatever, just throw some frozen vegetables in there and grind them up in your blender. But you need to get more fruits and vegetables in in general. There is no substitute. There is no vitamin or green powder or anything else that is going to be able to adequately replace those. And we're grown adults. There's no excuse for any of us to say, I can't eat vegetables or fruits. We're not eight years old. Every single one of us are grown adults who need to make adult decisions for our own health and well-being. And um, I just don't buy into that sort of thing. And I don't accept that kind of excuse. And you shouldn't either. You should expect more out of yourself. You're an adult. Behave like one. Eat your vegetables. All right. Next question. Deficit deadlift versus snatch grip deadlift for a deadlift accessory to increase range of motion. Is there a difference? Uh, yeah, there's a tremendous difference. What it comes down to is individual needs versus um, the equipment you have available. For example, if you're looking to just set up really quick, you don't want to stack plates, you don't want to stack blocks, you don't want to use any sort of platform or anything, and you just want to do it in a hurry to create a deficit to improve range of motion, the snatch grip deadlift is easy to do. Also, the snatch grip deadlift is uh, an accessory for Olympic lifters. So for them, it has a specific carryover to their sport. If you're doing some sort of deficit deadlift, though, um, or just trying to increase the range of motion purely to help you speed up your power off the floor on your conventional deadlift because that's a weak link for you, then just doing the deficit deadlift is going to be the better choice. Uh, just remember, it takes a little more work to set up because you have to put plates down or blocks or a platform or something to stand on. So it requires more work to set up, but it is going to have better carryover to your deadlift. However, again, if you're an Olympic lifter, the snatch grip deadlift has carryover to some of their lifts. So it really depends on your needs. But because you said for the deadlift as a deadlift accessory, I'm going to say the deficit deadlift is going to be your choice. All right, next question. I started your novice program later than I should have. Took me a while to see through all the bullshit in the fitness industry, but I finally opened my eyes. Anyways, I've been lifting for a few years, have made some decent gains, but I know I still have more left in the tank. My pause squat after one month of the program is at 245 uh, 5 rep max. I'm finding it very hard to progress every workout. Is this due to my gains starting to slow down, or do I just need to keep putting more weight on the bar and sack the fuck up? At what point should someone start seeing slower gains on your novice program all right brother there's a couple things going on part of your issue could be that you're going to make slightly slower progress because you missed out a little bit of your new games by not training correctly when you started out but i don't think that's your real problem here i think the real problem is that well you're doing uh, 245 for sets of five now and uh, getting stronger from there takes time. So it's not a matter of sacking up, it's a matter of just following the program. You're going to stall. There's gonna be times on this program where on a major exercise, you're gonna stall for upwards of a month, but all you can do is do the resets. When you start finding that they turn into grinders and you're struggling with that fifth rep, it's time to do the weight resets again. Reduce the weight 10% and build back up. If this happens to you like two or three times on the same exercise like a squat, it's time to start looking at your lifestyle. You need to make sure your diet's adequate. Are you getting enough carbs in? 
Are you getting enough calories in? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you getting all the nutrients and rest that you need to fully recover? Because you need to remember that my novice program is a very intense program. It isn't for everyone. People who don't have a nearly perfect lifestyle, and by perfect meaning at least can keep their stress manageable, have plenty of free time to sleep so they can get upwards of eight or nine hours of sleep every night and who can get in several meals a day and get adequate nutrition and who can afford a good balanced diet. So that's what you need to remember. This program is not for everyone. And so if you're finding uh, that you're stalling three times in a row at the same weight, uh, it might be time to start looking at your lifestyle factors and see if you can work with those. Or if you're reaching a point to where you might need a milder program, such as the cutting version of my program or my linear hypertrophy program. But remember, the novice program isn't for everyone. And um, your lifestyle basically just might not accommodate it. But you know, it might. It might just be the fact that the program is getting hard now because it should be getting hard at this point, And it's starting to uh, make you wonder if this program is right for you, if this is really what you want to be doing, or if you want to follow a program that's a, quite a, a little less taxing on your body. But, you know, you'll make a few percentages less muscle gain on And that's nothing to be ashamed of. Not everyone's lifestyle and their uh, needs can be accommodated by every program. All right, next question. Is training your calves using standing raises on a platform so that you do not stretch uh, superior to training them on an elevated platform so you do stretch? I've seen people advocate for the former due to the increased ability to overload. Thanks. No, I'm of the opinion that unless you're doing some sport specific movement to where you need stronger leverages through a strong point uh, in an exercise, and again, there are plenty of sport specific needs for this, that you need to be doing the, the longest range of motion that you can safely do on an exercise, even if you reduce the weight. Just like I advocate people doing the conventional deadlift instead of the sumo to keep the range of motion longer. I recommend people do the closed grip bench press, particularly the closed grip incline bench press instead of the wider grip. Again, they use a little less weight, but they've got to move it through a much longer range of motion. And I'm of the opinion that general strength and specifically hypertrophy benefit more from this. So because that's my general stance, I'm going to apply the same thing to calves. And yeah, I think that calves need to be stretched they need to be stretched through their full range of motion, and even if that means you use 30% less weight to do it, then so be it. Who cares about overloading at the top of an exercise uh, instead of working the full range of motion unless you have a sport-specific reason to be doing that? If you're trying to make your calves grow, uh, that definitely isn't a sport-specific need. You need to be doing that stretch. Stand on the elevated platform and get a deep stretch on them on every single rep. Uh, that would be my advice. All right, next question. Can I build impressive back by doing only barbell rows and pull-ups? Why Chris Jones says you need six exercises to build a great back? Well, as to why Chris Jones is saying that, I have absolutely no clue. I guess you'll have to take that up with him. I can't answer those questions for him. I would tell you that there isn't a single body part that you have, a single muscle group anywhere that you can't build to maximum development using two to three different exercises. And I would say for your back, Honestly, I think like pull-ups or chin-ups plus deadlifts is the ideal choice, but you know what? You could just as easily build a fantastic back using any two out of the three. Uh, there's nothing wrong with using all three, but I think you could build an amazing back using just pen lay rows and the deadlift or just barbell rows and the chin-up or the chin-up or the pull-up and the deadlift. I think it can be done with any of that combination of those. I tend to lean towards uh, chin-ups and deadlifts myself. But that should absolutely build you a tremendous, well-developed back. And i um, sorry, but anyone who tells you otherwise is full of shit. It just isn't necessary to do more than that. That should be able to do it. And if that doesn't do it, it's because you're not getting strong enough on those basic exercises. You get strong enough on those basic exercises there, things like uh, barbell rows, chin-ups, deadlifts, you're going to have tremendous and complete back development. And don't let anybody convince you otherwise. And as, again, as far as why is Chris saying that, I don't know. You'll have to ask him. I can't answer that question for him. All right, next question and last question of the week. What is the best method of training to improve rate of force development in athletes? Fantastic question. I'm going to say the answer is twofold because there's two different elements that you need to focus on in order to develop maximum rate of force development. For those who don't know what that means, that means power, explosive power. Uh, the two things you need is going to be number one, dead stop training, meaning training with pauses. 
uh, floor presses with a pause, bench press with a pause on your chest, pauses on your uh, squats, doing pause squats where you pause for a one or a two count at the bottom on every rep, deadlifts where you reset on every single rep, pendlay rows, push presses, things like that. Those exercises are going to help you develop initial force development from a dead stop. Dead stop training is your number one tool for developing rate of force development. Number two, I think a lot of athletes should be considering dynamic effort style training, uh, particularly dynamic effort with chains, but I think bands work even better. A lot of barbell band training for speed work or also called dynamic effort work, which is something that came out of uh, the Russian strength athlete circles. It was later picked up by Louis Simmons at Westside Barbell. And again, if you don't know a lot about that, do a little bit of research into dynamic effort training with bands and overspeed eccentrics. But I think that combination of things is the magic key to developing maximum power uh, and rate of force development in athletes is that combination of dynamic effort work using overspeed eccentrics with bands on their barbell work combined with a lot of heavy dead stop training and pause work and that should pretty well do it for you if you can't get explosive doing those things you're just not genetically built to get maximally explosive but the thing is anyone could get more explosive than they are now and i think that that combination is the winning ticket in my opinion all right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.